what's going on everybody this is john jake gaming on for mike here coming at you with a brand new episode of the ncsl dynasty here on ncaa 14 featuring that college football revamp we have just finished up an excellent season of college football one that culminates in a new national champion Ole Miss wins its first national championship here in year number four, and we are still searching for a team that could be able to repeat as we have had four separate champions in the span of four years. No team has really been able to create a true dynasty here, but in this episode, we are going through the entirety of the offseason and then maybe get a little peek of what's yet to come as well. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's going to be a fun one. going to be a long one. So make sure you go ahead, get settled in, get some popcorn. And with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe for me. And with that being said, let's go ahead and recap what we saw in that college football playoff. So this was what the final bracket did end up looking like when the dust completely settled in the college football playoff. Ole Miss was the team that ended up winning the national championship, but they didn't do it from a top four seed, which is the first time that we did end up seeing that since we saw the inclusion of a 12 team playoff in this series. Matter of fact, they weren't even a top team that you know, had to play in those first round games. They did it all the way from a seven seed in which three of the four games they did end up playing, they were considered the underdogs from that seed perspective. USC, on the other hand, did basically what they were supposed to do. They made it to the national championship as a one seed, but they did end up falling just short. It was an incredible college football playoff, and I'm really curious to see what teams can do in order to get back here next season or maybe see some new teams come into the mix as well. But now let's go ahead and take a look around to see what happened, you know, in terms of, you know, who won some awards and, you know, who ends up being an All-American when it's all said and done. So, that being said, this is what the all uh, the Heisman Award list ended up going to. We have a new Heisman winner. It's not the quarterback from Clemson this year, not one of your guys' customs, but it's the sophomore running back in Caleb Kirk. Caleb Kirk was the Doak Walker Award winner last season, and he was also the uh, Heisman finalist as a true freshman. Well, he only got better as a sophomore, ran for over 2,000 yards this season, 15 touchdowns. I don't know how he did it, but he found a way to get better from last season, and he's very deserving of this Heisman Award. Also on this list, you have the sophomore red shirt Victor Spence, and Victor Spence also got a handful of awards himself. He ended up winning both the Maxwell and the Walter Camp, nearly finished as a Heisman Trophy winner himself. A lot of youngsters really taking over college football with the top two guys being sophomores, Victor Spence threw for 5,000 yards this year. As for Rodney Walker, his teammate, he's one of the few seniors on this list. Rodney Walker as a senior might have been overshadowed by his teammate, but Rodney Walker really did have a breakout season. Hardly played in his first three years, but as a senior redshirt, he finally got an opportunity and made the most of it. Threw for almost 3,500 yards, 23 touchdowns through the air, and he also had 14 rushing touchdowns as well. He was a dangerous threat and really made the most of his opportunity. Speaking of opportunities, Jason Sims was also up there this year. He finishes fourth in the Heisman Trophy race. He ran for over 1,700 yards this season and 13 touchdowns to go with it. And rounding out your Heisman Trophy uh, finalists, is Dan Bishop, the senior out of West Virginia. The Champaign, Illinois product was able to run for almost 2,000 yards himself and 16 touchdowns, just that his team didn't make it as far as West Virginia did fail to not only win the MAC championship, but didn't even make it to the MAC championship game with a heartbreaking loss to Northern Illinois in the closing weeks of the regular season. 
As for the other award winners that we haven't had a chance to talk about uh, that weren't included, now we know that Victor Spence did win the Maxwell, and he also wins the, <clears throat> the Walter Camp Award as well. That is certainly no secret, and it makes you wonder if Victor Spence is considering going to the NFL after the season he just had. But there is other awards in college football as well, starting with the Begnerit Award. Begnerit Award this year is going to go to the junior linebacker from USC, Devin Felder. Devin Felder, a Sinocent New York product. He not only wins the uh, Buckkiss Award, but also wins the Begnerit Award as well. So a very versatile linebacker for the USC Trojans this year. He finished with over 110 tackles, not to mention seven sacks and multiple forced fumbles as well. He was someone that truly had a breakout campaign after recording just three tackles in his sophomore season. As for the Nagursti Award, the Nagursti Award is going to go to Anthony Tyson. Anthony Tyson is a senior red shirt that plays for the Miami Hurricanes. So not only do we have a Heisman Trophy winner, but we do have a Nagursti Award winner. And he also is the recipient of the Lombardi Award as well. His senior season, his final year of college football being his best season to date, as Anthony Tyson was able to set a career high in tackles, TFL sacks. He had his first and only double-digit sack season in the NCSL. Not only that, he also contributed a forced fumble and a fumble recovery, a well-deserved award for an interior defensive lineman that was a constant disruptor on that Miami Hurricanes front line. As for the O'Brien Award, and the O'Brien Award goes to the best quarterback in college football, is not treated as the player of the year. John Cross, man. John Cross led Northern Illinois to its first college football playoff. Ultimately, his team did end up getting knocked in the first round by Texas. But John Cross had an excellent senior season. Uh, did not play much his first couple of years, played sparingly, but in his senior season, he really took off of 63% completion percentage. Not to mention, he threw for nearly 5,000 yards, 47 touchdowns to just seven interceptions. He was an exceptional quarterback for the NIU Huskies this past season, and he was a big reason why this NIU squad was able to make it to the college football playoff in the first place, doing it in an option offense, which is captained by Thomas Hammock Jr., by the way, one of your guys' custom coaches. Now, there were some other uh, custom players that actually did make it onto this list. We do have guys like Frederick Moore. Frederick Moore is the senior quarterback for the Georgia Bulldogs, and while he didn't play great against Ole Miss in the quarterfinals, doesn't change the fact that he had an excellent season himself, throwing for over 4,300 yards and 31 total touchdowns on the season. Last year's Heisman Trophy winner did also appear on this list as well, Keisuke Nakamura. He had a little bit of a down year because of those injuries, unfortunately. But when he was on the field, he was effective, having nearly 3,000 yards of total offense and 31 touchdowns. But again, uh, that was a step back from how he did the previous season. Grant, he did take better care of the football and threw for more touchdown passes, which is a surprise. The rushing numbers were definitely down from last year, which hurt his Heisman stock, unfortunately. One more thing of note here, though, is that Taylor Steffens, Taylor Steffens was an FCS transfer. He transferred in from Southeast Missouri State, and right away, he did make his impact felt at West Virginia, winning the starting job with his last year of eligibility, and threw for almost 3,500 yards, an excellent senior season, couldn't lead West Virginia to the promised land, and even had a disappointing bowl game against Troy, but Taylor Steffen still had an excellent season representing from his for his original alma mater in Southeast Missouri State down the FCS level. Moving on to who won the Doak Walker Award. This was something that was won by Caleb Kirk last year. 
It's going to go to Brent Miller, the running back out of Colorado, making the cross-country trip from Virginia Beach, Virginia, to play his college football. Now, Brent Miller really, truly had that breakout season. His first couple of years, last couple of years been okay, you know, averaging 650 yards over the last couple of years, but... His senior year, he absolutely exploded onto the scene. 2,000 yards rushing, 23 touchdowns as well. He also chipped in with two receiving touchdowns too. So a well-deserved award. And it begs the question if Brent Miller would get any NFL interest because he is only an 84 overall to be fair. So definitely something to watch out for. Interesting enough, even though Caleb Kirk did end up winning the Heisman Trophy, he finished his second for the Doak Walker Award. Interesting stuff. You would think he would get the award because he's the Heisman Trophy winner, but that didn't happen. That really did not happen at all. What we do also see, though, is senior running back Walter McEnfee out of UCLA. He did transfer in from Nichols State. And he really shined. He ran for over a thousand yards, had 17 touchdowns. And even though his UCLA team did not defend his national championship effectively, Walter McAfee individually still had an excellent season. For the Blinikoff Award, it's going to go to senior wide receiver Pat Glover, uh, representing for Marion, South Carolina. The Clemson wide receiver uh, also had an excellent season over the course of this past season. His best season his senior year. And keep in mind, this was somebody that actually was a four-year starter. He actually started since day one, always having more than 450 yards receiving at any given time. But his senior year, he was able to put it all together, over 1,200 yards receiving, 15 touchdowns, which was more than his first three years combined and nearly doubled it as well. So... Pat Glover had that breakout season, and that's even with some volatility at the quarterback position. His starting quarterback was hurt for a good chunk of the season, and in spite of that, Pat Glover was still able to thrive this past season. As for the Mackey Award, that's going to go to Adam Williams, the tight end out of Rice. This is why you do not play with your food, folks. Adam Williams was able to craft out a good college career and able to use that big body Six foot seven, 271 pounds, and he runs like a deer. 84 speed for someone that moves that fast. You could see why this kid was an absolute problem, especially the last two years where Rice football really seemed to have taken off as of recently. I mean, it's been a nice resurgence for the Rice Owls, even though they've fallen short of that conference championship appearance the last couple of years. Adam Williams was able to finish his senior year with nearly 900 yards receiving and 13 touchdowns. He was unguardable when he was on the field. As for the Outland Trophy Award, that does go to one of the uh, best uh, offensive linemen in the country. And this year is going to be provided to Quinn Martinez, a senior redshirt out of the University of Michigan. He was able to have over 60 pancakes over the span of a season. While he did give up a career high in sacks, he still had the highest pancake to sack given up ratio in the entirety of college football. Meanwhile, Jumbo Tarusa uh, actually recorded more from the guard position. He had 76 pancakes over the course of the season. He had a great senior campaign and is looking to be an NFL caliber player. Finished third in the Outland Trophy race. As for the Remington Award, that goes to the best center in college football. It's going to be provided to Brent Ryan. Brent Ryan is a senior out of Harvey, Louisiana. That spent his last four years not only as a starter uh, or someone that has gotten consistent playing time, but someone that has been playing for his hometown team. You know, being a Louisiana product, going to LSU, he finishes the senior season off of not only being named an All-American, but Brent Ryan also wins the Remington Award this season. Now, we saw a couple of other awards, so we're now get, get ourselves over to the Jim Forpe Award real quick, and it's going to go to another USC defender. Seems like USC has been doing a great job producing defensive talent. This time, it's going to go to Nolan Less. Nolan Less, the senior out of Southgate, California, and nearly 100 tackles as a corner, so he was not afraid to come down and play in the box. 
Not to mention, he was a shutdown guy as well. Five pass breakups, three interceptions, his first three interceptions of his college career. His junior season was a good season, but he just took his game to a whole nother level. Plus, he managed to find a way to block two separate kicks. So that's something to also monitor as well. Do have one of your guys' custom players in here, Joseph Sebastian Harris who is also on the four pay finalist list as a sophomore mind you he had two defensive touchdowns this year so a great sophomore season uh might be a superstar in the making out there at usc uh, might be uh some big shoes to fill though with no one less graduating now we we'll finally get to the kickers punters and other special team assortments for the Groza Award, it's going to go to Chris Jefferson, who's a senior kicker out of Toledo. The Rockets kicker was able to hit almost every field goal and also only miss one extra point as well with a long of 51 yards. So some good kicking for the Toledo kicker for sure. As for the Kyle Guy Award, though, it goes to the best punter in America. It's going to go to a sophomore. Sam Lambert was able to receive such honors. Uh, he averaged over 40 yards per punt net, and that is even accounting for those, um, those opportunities for punt returners to actually bring it back to the crib. Sam Lambert was also able to down eight separate punts inside the 20-yard line. The Mac Macon Georgia product had a big boot on this guy and he still has a couple of years to grow and finally we now get to the jet award which goes to the best return man in all of college football this year it went to Corey blair and Corey blair did this even though he did not play in a full season he announced because well unfortunately you know injuries do happen but even though those injuries do end up happening and even though he couldn't make much of a difference offensively, only had three catches for 22 yards this season, he was able to have nearly 1,000 return yards over a span of a season. He had over 900 return yards over the span of the year, and he also had two touchdowns that he was able to take to the crib as well. So Corey Blair, even though he took a step back in his wide receiver duties, he was still able to find a way to be successful and be a contributing factor in his sophomore season. Speaking of sophomores that are making impacts, we do have one of your customs in here as well. In Mason Williams, the sophomore running back was able to accrue over 800 return yards over the span of a season. Grand, he was not able to take any of them to the crib. But now let's take some time to take a look at your award winners here in your number four, at least in terms of who ended up getting all American honors. Now we do have some familiar faces already. John Cross being one of them who won the O'Brien and Brent Miller who did won the Mackey award. But for the other running back, it's going to go to Matthew Russell, a junior redshirt out of Pleasant Hill, California who made a cross-country trip to join the Army Academy. Matthew Russell very well could have been a Doak Walker Award winner himself as he ran for over 800, 1,800 yards. He had 22 touchdowns as well. He certainly had an argument for being able to receive multiple of these awards this year. Just uh, it didn't happen because, frankly, Army is a little bit of a smaller profile type of program. And that happens sometimes, you know, when it comes to the awards. Roy DeLuca, on the other hand, has really gotten some attention of folks as Roy DeLuca from Troy won first team All-American and he had a breakout season in which he came into this year with only four career catches and he ends up being someone that has almost 1,500 yards of receiving. So from being a virtual unknown to someone that actually gets to be a first team All-American, that's a massive jump. Matt Owens could say the same thing, plays higher than the overall as Matt Owens, even though he won the Blinnikoff last year and he didn't have the same stats this year, he still had an excellent season, 1,300 yards, 12 total touchdowns. He even had a long of 69 yards, which we can all agree is very nice. Adam Williams is here. He won the best tight end award for the Rice Owls. And your offensive line is going to consist of Quinnen Martinez from Michigan, Cedric Hopkins out of Texas, Jared Grant out of USC, 
Jumbo Tarusa out of Miami. That's one of your guys' customs. And rounding out your offensive line is Aaron Samuel, the right tackle senior out of USC. Moving over to the defensive side of the ball, though, we got Steven Riley, a senior out of the Ohio State University. The Ohio State product sets a career high in sacks, double-digit sacks in his senior campaign, and should be good enough to receive some college attention if he certainly wants it. On the opposite side is Stanley Jones, who uh, has been a fixture uh, since his freshman season, actually. Won the Nagurski and the Lombardi as a true freshman. Never lived up to those stats after his freshman year, but a very solid college career, accruing over 50 sacks as a Miami Hurricane. Rounding out your defensive line is Anthony Thompson, who won multiple awards for the Miami Hurricanes as well. And then you got Lance Warren as the final defensive lineman for the first team All-Americans. The senior pass rusher out of Tennessee was able to accrue 10 and a half sacks this year, plus 30 TFLs as well. Now, moving on to the linebackers, you got Terrell Skinner, the junior out of Texas. The Longhorn linebacker was able to accrue over 120 tackles this season. Not to mention able to get free interceptions as well. He was the heart and soul of the Texas defense. It's going to be a million dollar question though if he decides to forgo his senior year of eligibility. David Felder who won multiple awards at right outside linebacker from USC. And then rounding out your linebacking core is Chris Russell. The senior outside linebacker out of Signal, Texas. The Miami Hurricane product was able to... Even though he didn't have as good of a year as what he was able to do a couple years ago or even last year, still an excellent linebacker, though. Just knows how to do different things, especially putting the ball on the ground. He had five forced fumbles this year. That leads everybody in the NCSL. Finally, we get to your corners and your defensive backs. Uh, your custom Joseph Sebastian Harris. He's a first-team All-American at the first corner spot. With Joe Castillo as a true freshman getting the nod as a freshman All-American. Joe Castillo was in prom last year. And now he is considered one of the best young corners in college football. Not eye-popping stats by any means, but he showed immediately that he was an absolute ball hawk this year. Not to go in his direction by any means. For the safeties, you got Travis Morris, the sophomore out of USC and Travis Morris was able to accrue 60 tackles and five pass breakups uh, in his sophomore campaign and of course you got Nolan West who won your Jim Forpe award finally Corey Ward actually gets first team all-american honors the Ole Miss kicker out of Isapapa Mississippi was able to hit 20 for 21 and made almost all of his extra points this season Sam Wernbert, who won the Kyle Guy Award, he ends up being first-team All-American as well. And Aaron Wheeler, surprisingly, gets first-team All-American at the returner spot. Aaron Wheeler was able to actually have some decent returns over the course of his uh, sophomore campaign. Two kick return touchdowns in his sophomore season. And then the punts were pretty good as well. He averaged over eight yards of punt return. He was a weapon with the ball in his hands. And I'm excited to see what he does with a bigger role in future seasons. Now, moving on to the second team All-Americans. And we got Victor Spence, the quarterback out of USC. Caleb Kirk, who actually won the Heisman Trophy, but was not even named a first team All-American. Makes you wonder if the Heisman Trophy Committee actually got it right or not. But his other running back, Daniel Parker, well, he's certainly deserving of these honors. The junior from Minnesota was able to accrue 1,500 yards of rushing, 20 touchdowns as well. So he had a nose for the end zone. Big reason why Minnesota nearly made it, actually did make it to the college football playoff. However, they had that unfortunate upset against Navy, as mentioned earlier. Pat Glover is here as well. He won the uh, best wide receiver in college football this year. But you also got Andre Drod in here, the senior out of Charleston, Illinois. The Illinois Fighting Illini receiver 
was able to flash those excellent hands in his senior campaign. 84 catches for 1,500 yards and 12 touchdowns. Even though he had eight drop passes, he showed that he was definitely worthy of being a wide receiver one in college football. Rounding out your offensive skill players is Brian Jennings, the junior out of USC. The USC Trojan uh, from Castle Rock, Colorado. That is a heck of a name, by the way. Uh, showed that he was a constant threat. The six foot five junior accrued 1,200 yards receiving and he knows a thing or two about getting some blocks as well. Just a complete tight end for the USC Trojans. This now takes us to the offensive line. It was Josh Ellis, the senior out of Georgia, uh, got the first honor. Derek McNamara of USC. Brent Ryan, your Outland Trophy Award winner from LSU. Well, he was actually a second team All-American as well. Anthony Gillett, the junior out of Michigan, is on this list. And running out your offense is Dustin Smith, the senior red shirt out of the Ohio State University. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, we start with the junior, T.J. Bowen, the sophomore red shirt out of Plaquemine, Louisiana. T.J. Bowen continuing to break out and wreak havoc on Sunbelt defenses, it, or Sunbelt offenses, and living in the nightmares of offensive coordinators around the country. Already has racked up 15 sacks in his young career, and he still has two more years of eligibility. That's the crazy part. On the opposite side is Paul Moore, the junior out of USC. The Cushing, Oklahoma product was a your Beggar Award winner last year, but couldn't live up to those same expectations. He had a dip compared to last season. Rounding out that defensive line, you got Ben Barrett, the sophomore out of Ole Miss. A lot of young guys on the squad, but Avondon, Arizona should be proud of this young man right here as, well, he didn't have many sacks, he was a disruptor in the running game with 20 TFLs on the way to Ole Miss winning a national championship. The other defensive tackle goes to Chad Hughes, the senior, also out of Charleston, Illinois. Lots of love for uh, Charleston, Illinois. There was an Illinois player on this list uh, for the wide receivers. Literally the same stats as last year with the exception of a few more stats. And hey, maybe he got himself a fumble or two in the process as well. Now, we take ourselves to the linebackers, and for the linebackers, we start with Adam Hurst. The junior out of USC was someone that has was a starter last year, but then has grown into a star for USC this season. With eight sacks, five pass deflections, Adam Hurst was practically instituting a no-fly zone, even though he can do a little bit of everything. Jeff Castillo is also here as he's a junior out of Idaho Falls. The junior linebacker for Hurricanes was able to put together a jack-of-all-trades type season as he was able to get some sacks, was able to force a turnover or two along the way, and hey, he was even able to get a defensive touchdown in the process. Final linebacker spot does go to the junior in Lance Richardson from Country Club Estab uh, Estates, Georgia. Lance Richardson hardly played his first couple of years, but his junior year, he was unleashed. And you could see the talent on his kid. Four forced fumbles in his junior campaign, and he still has one more year of eligibility remaining. Finally, get to the corners, and as well as other defensive backs for the second team All-Americans. Danny Johnson, the senior out of Texas, was able to get six interceptions this year and 10 pass deflections. People tried him, but they found out real quick why Danny Johnson is certifying him. Joe Walden is also going to be your second team All-American at the corner position as Joe Walden, a senior at LSU, was able to have a breakout campaign after only having 43 total tackles in his first three seasons. While he wasn't able to get any interceptions, he was a constant disruptor for opposing offenses. Finally, for your safeties, you got Bob Cooper, the sophomore out of Michigan. The Wynwood, California product was able to start for the first time in his college career and made the most of his opportunity, able to get five pass deflections as well as 51 total tackles. Finally, you got Kelvin Garrett, the junior out of LSU from Siowa City, North Carolina. He ended up finishing with eight pass deflections himself, 
and five interceptions in his junior campaign. Finally, you got Chris Jefferson, the senior kicker out of Toledo, who did win the Lou Garza Award, going to the best kicker in college football. William Moore, the senior punter out of USC, uh, representing for Kentucky. And your return man for the second team All-Americans is Mark Palmer, who is a senior out of LSU. Puts up some decent stats in his college career, but is more known for his special teams prowess. His special teams prowess uh, led him to having over 25 yards average for kick returns. And he was also able to take two separate touchdowns to the crib during his time as a return man in all four years that he was on campus for the LSU Tigers. As this will wrap up your All-American list. Now, one more thing that I wanted to check before we jump into the rest of the offseason is I just was curious and seems in terms of who was your just statistical leaders over the course of the season. So some of these shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but Victor Spence was the only passer in college football to have over 5,000 yards, but John Cross was right on his tails with 4,900 yards. And that was even with USC being able to play three more games than NIU. So John Cross probably had an, a higher average, but Victor Spence did throw for more total yards. For the runners, Caleb Kirk did lead the NCAA with over 2,200 yards rushing. Two other people did have over 2,000 yards, so and Brent Miller, who ran for 2,000 yards, and Justin Fawarda, who ran for 2,079 yards. He was on an insane run as Ole Miss was unstoppable in his quest to win a national championship. For the receivers, Aaron Dodd out of Illinois was the only wide receiver to catch more than 1,500 yards receiving over the course of the season uh, a few other people did get close but close only counts in horseshoes hand grenades and nuclear missiles for tackles dyson skinner out of texas led the T uh, ncsl with total tackles three other people were able to record triple digits including matt king of notre dame and king another king of old miss as well nolan west was close at 99 Dickerson out of Arkansas was actually tied with Stanley Jones. Both guys did end up having 13 sacks, but we didn't really hear from Dickerson as much. Surprised that he actually wasn't an All-American, given how this list actually shaken out. Finally, for interceptions, two guys ended with seven interceptions. That was a tie for first place. Nichols out of the Naval Academy, and Navy had that with Stanley run to the semifinals. Well, Hoffman out of Southern Miss was also able to accrue seven interceptions. Finally, the NCSL kicking leaders, so these are the people that had the longest field goals, was Landrum out of Boston College, Smith out of Oregon, and Pierce out of Texas Tech. All three of those guys were able to hit a field goal of at least 55 yards. It is a tie for the longest field goal that was hit over the course of this season. Now, one of my favorite things about the offseason that I've consistently loved and enjoy was I've always enjoyed myself some coaching carousel. And because of how some of these custom coaches perform, I'm expecting to see some more love from our custom coaches here. So really interesting to see where everyone ends up. But the first head coaching job that is out in the open is this Rutgers has coaching job. Phil Longo does retire after leading Rutgers to an 8-5 record, and that also includes um, winning that bowl game against Coastal Carolina. Eventually, that goes to Scott Simons, who was the head coach at Rice. So, Rice losing their head coach, so we'll have to see who Rice goes with. I think they get an excellent head coach considering how he was able to maximize the talent at Rice, especially this last season. Boise State, on the other hand, is also in need of a head coach of its own. Brian Harson was fired after Boise State did end up going 4-8 and eight this past season. And Andy Avalos is going to be hired. He was the defensive coordinator at Hawaii this past season, but... With that said, he actually is a alma mater. Boise State is his home, and he runs a Boise State playbook as well. So 
it seems like it could be an excellent fit for them to turn around this historically good program within the Mountain West. And now Stanford is also in need of its head coach as well. Pete Golding was fired after a 4-8 and campaign. It's hard to compete out in the Pac-12. It just, it just be like that sometimes. Defensive coordinator Phil Stewart is looking to get that upgrade. Going to remain in the conference though. Phil Stewart is going to make the trip from USC. Now going to Stanford after USC nearly won the national championship falling just short to all miss but it certainly was not his fault though as for baylor baylor went five and seven this year as dave arana has been relieved of his duties thomas hammock jr is getting a little bit of love here so this could be a good choice for him if they choose to go in that direction but instead they do go for ohio head coach joe moorhead who led the Ohio Bobcats to a 10 and free campaign, knows how to run multiple offensive sets, and is looking to continue to use that offensive fertility as Baylor is trying to build itself back up within the Big 12 Conference. Now, with that said, we got a lot going on with Louisiana Tech. Mac Warner was fired after uh, failing to beat his goals, and they got a lot of talent, and there's a good future here uh, at Louisiana Tech, Matt Kumblick is going to be uh, bestowed the opportunity, though, to pursue this as Matt Kumblick did lead Florida State to an 11-2 record, is a little bit on the run heavy side. So we'll see if he's able to be more of a CEO type than someone that's more hands-on with the offense because I wasn't impressed with Florida State offensively this year, even though the Seminoles did go 11-2. Now, with that said, we do see the opening for the Rice job finally coming up next. Uh, we did see Scott Simmons leave to take the head coaching job at Rutgers. So now Rice will be looking for its first head, its next head coach. And they are going to hire the head coach from Ball State. They are going to go ahead and hire Bobby Henry, who during his time at Ball State, he led him to a 9-4 record, really turned that program around, and now because he did so good, Ball State is going to need a new head coach again. It's just the, uh, the circle of life that is college football sometimes. Now, Charlotte, this is a little bit of a surprise. Uh, Charlotte is in need of a head coach themselves. Tim Dranvo did retire at the age of 67. Charlotte, a nice program, but... You know, I was surprised to see them go eight and five because of how, you know, not much talent is on this roster, if that makes sense. I mean, a 75 overall team going eight and five, that's a kudos to what kind of coaching job he was able to accomplish this year. But now Charlotte is going to be in need of a new head coach. And that new head coach is going to be the defensive coordinator from the University of Michigan. And that is going to be Charlotte's very own, uh, Michigan's very own, Ray Hurst, defensive coordinator for the Wolverines. Took him out to a 12-0 start, but they did drop their next couple of games. So, not coming in with a ton of momentum as a coach, but Ray Hurst is looking to continue to build the work that has been done previously by Trim Tim Drevno. Up next, you got the head coaching position at Fresno State coming up on deck. And Fresno State looking hard at Jake Jacobs. We'll see if they go in his direction. And surprisingly, they don't. Instead, they go with Barry Odom, the defensive coordinator at Army. Army, another one of those guys. Yes, they won the Hawaii Bowl, but was a little bit disappointed by how they couldn't finish the deal with the Conference USA Championship. They were favored over Navy, and it just didn't work out. Still a wonderful coach, and I think Fresno State just needed something different. Brings a different philosophy to the table. After Cole Bray did low-key uh, bring this Fresno State program uh, to the ground. Now, up next, we have the head coaching position at UCF. Jason Williams going to be fired after failing to meet his goals for a 3-9 and nine campaign. And uh, not a lot of love for the custom coaches, it seems like. I'm actually surprised to see that 
we're not really seeing the custom coaches being pursued. Instead, we will see the Colorado defensive coordinator get hired here. Um, someone that is from that Texas Tech pipeline uh, runs that Auburn spread. Only going to turn things around after Jeff Simon was part of that Colorado staff that went to the college football playoff as champions of the Mountain West. After that, the Ohio head coaching job does become open. I'm surprised Ohio is a one-star school. And the reason why I'm surprised to see Ohio being a one-star school is because they just won 10 games. They just won a bowl game as well. So I'm shocked to see Ohio just being a you know one-star school for say. Now, George Gentry is the one that gets the first crack at this, right? Uh, from the University of Nebraska. But here's the thing, you know, George Gentry, uh, he's someone that felt like there's a lot of unfinished business here, you know, felt like he kind of let Nebraska down. And one thing that he really wants to do, also a couple of coaches got fired, ooh wee, um, or, you know, contracts inspire, you know, it happens sometimes. Um, but yeah, it just feels like there's a lot of unfinished business here. So actually it's going to surprise some people, but George Gentry is not going to go for this Ohio job. He is not going to go for the Ohio job, and instead, Thomas Hammock Jr. gets looked at. Now, Thomas Hammock Jr. really wanted the opportunity to be a head coach, and he's going to get it here. Thomas Hammock Jr. did some great work recruiting and building up Northern Illinois, and now he comes to Ohio. Seems like there's a good base here, you know, a 10-win season, their best season that they've had in quite some time. And now, just looking to build off of that, you know, see if they can compete with the Ohio States of the world, the Michigans of the world. So, it's going to be an interesting challenge here for Thomas Hammock Jr., but he's going to jump on this opportunity. He's going to go for it, and I love that for him. Now, with that said, Texas Tech is going to be in need of a new head coach as well. And it says here that Joey McGuire is going to retire but let's be real with ourselves for a second. If he didn't step down, um, he was going to be relieved of his duties. I mean, we got to be real with ourselves for a split second here, right? So new head coach, need a new uh, person to lead this program. And again, not going with the custom coaches here. This is just not a great coaching carousel uh, for these custom coaches at all, it feels like. Uh, it's kind of like we're getting the short end of the stick. Eventually, Texas Tech does end up hiring the offensive coordinator from Clemson in Eric Morris. Uh, Clemson being one of those guys uh, able to mentor a Heisman Trophy winner. And even with his defending Heisman Trophy winner out for much of the season, it would lead him to 10 wins. Plus, he is a Texas Tech guy. He is uh, from that Texas Tech alma mater. So I get where they were coming from. Air Force, on the other hand, is looking for a new staff. So, uh, yes, uh, that does mean uh, that Deion Kirby, the offensive coordinator, will be also uh, looking for a new job. Um, that being said, Jake Jacobs gets offered a chance to be the coach at Air Force. And listen, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge to build this program up. They have not won more than five games since 2022 so since this ncsl series has been going air force has not been able to reach a bowl game but jake jacobs you know he has that background at multiple stops you know being a defensive coordinator at temple tcu georgia most recently he's going for us he wants to challenge he's a hyper competitive guy and he's ready for what's going to come his way so jake jacobs is going to become the new head coach of the air force falcons Meanwhile, over at Ball State, the Ball State Cardinals are in need of a new head coach, given that, well, they do not have that um that guy leading that program at the moment, right? Uh, he left to take the rice job. So who's going for it is so William McNair has actually offered this particular position. Um the thing with it though is that Duke also offered him to remain at Duke as well. And at the end of the day, while William McNair could be enticed by maybe by a better job, he's going to go and accept the contract extension extend from the Duke Blue Devils. So he's going to remain the head coach of Duke, even though maybe Duke isn't the best job in the world. He's not going to be phased by the fact that, well, 
um, Ball, Ball, Ball State is calling for him. However, Ball State will eventually will hire somebody, and it's the head coach that was fired from Baylor. Dave Aranda is coming to Ball State. Is it the most inspiring hire in the world? Probably not. Is it the hire that they're going to rock with anyways? Yeah, they're going to go ahead and rock with that. So, new head coach for Ball State. We'll see if he can build off his 9-4 campaign that was completed by Bobby Henry. So those head coaching positions continue to come on open here as we now get to the Mid-Tennessee State head coaching position. The Mid-Tennessee head coaching position is going to eventually be filled by the offensive coordinator, Alex Golosh. Another one from that Rice coaching staff being poached at the end of the day. He now gets an opportunity to lead a program, and this was after Kyle Flood did retire following a 3-9 campaign for the Mid-Tennessee State Blue Raiders. Also in need of a head coach is the Jayhawks of Camp Kansas. Uh, Des Kitchens obviously being fired after that 1-11 campaign. And it looks like Greg Moore is going to be named the head coach of Kansas football going forward. He was a defensive coordinator for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. And didn't want to be retained by the new head coach. New head coach was hired earlier. He's going to instead try his head coaching prowess being the new head coach of Kansas football. But we spent some time going through the rest of the coaching carousel as there was mostly uh, like offensive coordinator and other coordinator spots after that. Um, the NIU job does come open for the offensive coordinator spot because um, the previous guy, you know, Thomas Hammock Jr., one of your guys' customs, did end up taking a job as a head coach. He's now head coaching at Ohio. Go Bobcats, by the way. So, with that being said, the offensive coordinator job comes open, and Isaac Thompson, who had an excellent season at Virginia, by the way, well, he gets offered this position at NIU. I mean, this is a nice landing stop spot, especially after what NIU was able to accomplish the last couple of years. You know, 23 wins in the last two years, so will it be easy for them to live for Isaac Thompson to live things up at Virginia? Yeah, it's going to absolutely be difficult. But at the same time, though, there's a good base here and a you know, different offensive approach that's going to open things up. Maybe this guy is the moon for this NIU squad. So Isaac Thompson is going to jump on this opportunity and become your new offensive coordinator for the NIU Huskies leaving Virginia behind. But there was another uh, head coaching position that did end up opening up eventually, and Washington State is in need of another head coach. Now, they went through this coaching carousel process last year looking for a new head coach, and I wasn't a fan of the hire, and I was right. I was absolutely right. Washington State only goes 2-10. Remy Natias, the offensive coordinator at Oregon, though, had Oregon finished very strong, going eight and four. Well, he wants to be a head coach. I feel he feels like he's earned this opportunity to actually be a head coach. Now, it's gonna be a ground up thing because Washington State has only won three games in the last two years. But give Remy Natalia some time. I'm confident that he can absolutely cook here. And that does open up that offensive coordinator spot for Oregon, a quality program, by the way, because of the fact that he did leave that head coaching job at Washington State. But that wasn't the only head coaching job that ended up happening now, did it? Now, J.D. Weeks was looking around and see what was available, looking to either be a higher level assistant or, you know, even a coach at a smaller program. And Old Dominion certainly feel, fills that bill, right? Old Dominion is coming in as one of the worst teams in college football. They are 1-11 this past season. And it's been a country mile minute since they've done anything irrelevant. Since 2021, when they finished 7-7, seven and seven, they haven't finished above 500. So Old Dominion is certainly facing some tough times. But tough times create great men. And J.D. Weeks will accept the head coaching offer and will be your new head coach at Old Dominion this upcoming season. Now, I mentioned before that Deion Kirby was fired from his duties, but he de eventually does end up finding a 
new home, and that is at San Jose State. The San Jose Star Spartans are coming off of a 4-8 season as someone that did end up going ahead and participating in independent action. Decent football team, not a great football team. They pulled up a good couple of good moments, but they've never been to a bowl game, at least not in the last four seasons. So we'll have the final <laughs> opening. Deion Kirby is going to be the offensive coordinator at San Jose State. Now, with that said, some of the other custom coaches that we had in this series that did end up getting relieved of their duties, well, they did also find other places to call home. Sam Cash, for example, he was working with, I believe, under old DU's uh, coaching staff. He was fired as their offensive coordinator, but he was able to land on his feet, becoming the offensive coordinator at Kansas State. Matt Weeks, the younger brother of J.D. Weeks, who actually did just become a head coach uh, right before our eyes at Old Dominion. Well, Matt Weeks is now the defensive coordinator at Purdue. He's going to be looking to rebuild his brand, trying to rebuild a defense that was one of the worst in the NCSL in year number four. Jamaro Lewis is now the new offensive coordinator at UAB after Alex Sanders, a fellow offensive coordinator, uh, custom coach, was fired. So Jamaro Lewis will get a second shot after he was previously the offensive coordinator at Appalachian State. And Alex Sanders is actually going to serve under J.D. Weeks as his offensive coordinator. Uh, Alex Sanders is going to look to try to build up the worst offense in college football an Old Dominion team that averaged less than 16 points a game. But now we move on to one of the more difficult parts of the offseason. And one of the more difficult parts of the offseason is that we have players that are leaving or transferring or trying their NFL aspirations. Starting with the transfer portal, there was a few people of note. Jan Durant is going to go into his transfer portal. This is the second USC quarterback. That's one of your custom guys in the last two years to do that. Now, last year, Cody Kesler III transferred to Arizona, but Jaden Durant, he's going to go in an opposite direction. He's going to go to UCF. He wants to be a part of that UCF program that is going to rebuild. Should get plenty of opportunities to start there when that time eventually comes. Got a big arm, but doesn't have doesn't feel like he's going to play anytime soon at USC. So that's why he is going to leave that program ultimately. But he is not the only person that's planning on leaving. Now, this is a big-time pickup for Army. Jerome Oliver, he's a sophomore right tackle from Palm Bay, Florida, wants to go to the Army Academy and serve his country. You know, just might be a little bit of a change of heart. And this is someone that actually has played meaningful college football. This is someone that was a starter as a true freshman, did not have as much of a role in his sophomore campaign, but he still had nine pancakes total in the 2026 campaign. So Army's going to get a very good offensive lineman here moving forward. Other things to note is Jake Durant from St. Martinsville, Louisiana. True freshman, was a true freshman and actually contributed as a true freshman, but not real fan of the coach, not real fan of the culture. And so Jake Durant going to leave LSU and is going to join um, Southern Mississippi, which is in the conference, by the way. So that'll be real interesting. Scott Tanner is another guy as well. He's a freshman at Penn State. He was someone that also had somewhat some playing time as a backup. Average three yards to carry as a true freshman. A couple of rushing touchdowns. Nothing too crazy, but he's going to go to Notre Dame. He's going to Notre Dame to try and earn himself some more playing time. Notre Dame, I would imagine, is a deeper program overall than Penn State at the moment. So, real interested to see how this works out for Scott Tanner. And then, not to mention, you got Seth Blair leaving as well. He's a sophomore from Colorado. Now, Colorado's head coach is departing. He has moved on to be a head coach over at UCF. And so that's a big reason why he's leaving, uh, wants to follow his defensive coordinator. Seth Blair is a good player. Seth Blair has played the last couple of years, was a contributor getting five sacks in the last couple of seasons and free pass deflections. So UCF getting some good ads in this transfer portal between uh, Jake Duran and Seth Blair as well. 
That being said, though, let's take a quick look around the country to see who could be moving on to the NFL. And this is what this list is ultimately going to look like. But starting with the quarterbacks, got two first round caliber quarterbacks in Lester Jones, who's a senior redshirt at the University of Colorado. And then Greg Hunt, the senior out of Notre Dame. Uh, this guy had a rough senior year. This was not a great senior year for him, but they love his intangibles. They love his skill sets. And because of that, they want to give him a chance to be an NFL quarterback. He's got first round upside for sure. And here's some other quarterbacks that are declaring for the NFL draft as well. At running back, there's slightly more talent as there's three uh, guys that are going to be projected for the first round. Aaron Downs for out of Michigan is going to be the top running back available. But Jason Sims is also on this team as well. So a duo of Michigan guys looking to go in the first round alongside Tim Hayden. Tim Hayden is someone that had a decorate, decorated career at the University of Nebraska. Nearly 6,000 rushing yards when it's all said and done. A couple of FCS guys in here as well. Walter McAfee out of Nickel State. And then Pedro Carter, who also transferred in from the FCS level is also getting NFL buzz as well, even though Pedro Carter was a backup this year. For the fullbacks, not much to write home about for the fullbacks, but Quinn Williams, Anthony Butler, and Willie Russ are looking to revive what is a dead breed for the fullback position. At wide receiver, we actually do have one of your customs to clear for the NFL draft, and that is DeJounte Joseph. Dante Joseph is a junior at the University of Auburn. He's projected to go in the seventh round. So he might have been better served to stay for one more year, but he had a solid career, though. He always was hovering around 650 to 700 yards, uh, has 15 career touchdowns to his name. He's a good wide receiver. I don't know if he's a great wide receiver, though. I feel like he would have benefited more for staying one more year and coming back for his senior season. Now, as for a few other wide receivers that are going to get much more love than that, John Bain out of Memphis is looking to be the top wide receiver in this draft class, followed by Eddie Robinson out of Nebraska, Jordan Houston of Tennessee, and Danny Nicholson out of the University of Washington. At tight end, the only tight end that is looking to go in the first round is Mike Coleman, who is a senior out of Ohio State. For left tackle, we have Quinn Martinez, who is, of course, one of the best tackles in college football this year, alongside Tim Roach, who is a senior from the University of Texas. At left guard, there actually is no left guards that are projected to go in the first round, but quite a diversity of players here, though, uh, that do have NFL abilities. The same could also be said for the centers as well, as there is no first round projected players. Brent Ryan is the Remington Award winner, though, and he's projected to go in the fourth, as of what uh, NCAA 14 is telling me. On the opposite side of the offensive line, though, you got Jared Grant, who plays right guard at USC. He is a first-round projection uh, to the NFL. One of your custom guys, though, is getting a little bit of love in regard, though, as Jumbo Tarosta is going to be a second-round pick, uh, playing a great senior season at the University of Miami. The gamble paid off. And finally, to finish up with the offensive side of the ball, Anton Aaron Samuel is going to be the best right tackle in this draft class. He is a 94 overall from USC. However, we Lamb C from the FCS powerhouse, at least for those of you that watched the FCS dynasty back in the day in uh, Western Carolina, he transfers to West Virginia for his last season and played pretty well his senior year. Well enough, actually, that he's going to be a seventh round draft pick. Who says FCS guys can't make it to the NFL? As for the defensive side of the ball now, this should not be really any surprise here. Stanley Jones has been a fixture of the Miami defense since we started this series, so there is absolutely no surprise that we see him going in the first round of the NFL draft. At the opposite side of the defensive line, though, we have more top-end prospects. So, Leon Hunter, who is a senior from Georgia, alongside Mike Pace out of Michigan, and Josh Banks from USC could certainly be found here. Do want to also give a special shout-out to Jamie Baker. He was a FCS transfer from Delaware. 
came in and played at Ball State for his final year of eligibility and helped really turn things around at Ball State and he turned himself into a seventh round draft pick. You love to see it. And then at defensive tackle, we have a couple of other high-end prospects. Neil Andrews, the senior out of Michigan. Jeremy Clark, the senior redshirt out of San Diego State. And then Sean Johnson, the senior out of Troy, representing for the Troy Trojans. Moving on now to the linebacker position, though, we got Deshaun French, the senior out of LSU. This was one of your guys' customs that was able to ball out during his time at LSU. He ended up accruing almost 200 tackles, 7 sacks, and 8 pass deflections. But what made him most dangerous is those 27 TFLs and those multiple force fumbles as well. He was an absolute menace to society and worthy of that first round grade. Also getting some love is Clifton Manning, who's a projected fifth round pick. This is a guy that also transferred from the FCS level. He, his first three years were at Montana before transferring to USF. And when it was all said and done, Clifton Manning put together a great career uh, at USF. Or at least help wrap things up uh, in terms of uh, you know his college football career. As for the middle linebackers, it was not as deep for the middle linebackers. So one person that is catching NFL eyes, though, is Steve Burley, who happens to be a senior red shirt out of Nebraska. And that in spite of him only being 5'11", by the way. At right outside linebacker, there's no first round projected picks, but a few FCS guys will get drafted as well. BJ Crumpler, who finds himself at Florida State. David McDonald's, who finds himself at Washington and Trey Johnson, who spent his last year at Western Michigan. Meanwhile, at corner, gotta give some love to Will Silopec. Could have went to the NFL last year, but stuck around an extra year, and it really paid off. Not only did he get to see NIU into the college football playoff, but in addition to that, Will Silopec ends up becoming a first-round pick because of that, too. He'll be joined by Brian Holman out of the University of Michigan and Danny Johnson out of Texas. Meanwhile, rounding up your skill guys for the defensive side of ball, the only free safety that has a first round draft grade is Justin Bell, who is a senior at the University of Alabama. And then there's also Michael Bass, who is a senior red shirt out of the University of California. Finally, only two kickers did end up getting drafted this year. John Brown, a senior out of Hawaii, and... The senior out of Nebraska in Marcus Archie, who was also an All-American. And two other punters were drafted. Mark Clemens being one. He's from Auburn. And Rondell Powers, the senior out of Ole Miss. So here we are. We make our way to signing day. And on signing day, we actually do have a couple of surprises in terms of uh, what we did end up encountering in this top 25 in terms of recruiting classes as well as some other notable rankings that will be saw uh georgia georgia does sign the number one class that is not a surprise to me at all they signed 15 blue chip players out of their 22 person class uh headlined by a couple of athletes that are going to be joining the team as well as a five-star wide receiver uh it should be a top of the line class at number two, got Washington. Washington had an excellent season as well. The Washington Huskies uh, did finish as a top 20 team in the nation. They beat Rice uh, in, a, in a bowl game. Texas. Texas comes in at number three. Was a shaky start for Texas. Did not know if we were going to see them in the playoffs or even in a major bowl game. But pull it together and Texas does make it all the way to the quarterfinal where they narrowly lost to USC. They signed that number three class. Speaking of USC, though, the Trojans, who almost won a national championship, USC signs the number four ranked recruiting class in college football. They should continue to be close to the top in terms of uh, the upper echelons of college sports. Michigan, Michigan signs the number five class in Michigan. Uh, while they did not win their um their conference championship and they didn't win their bowl game either michigan finishing 12 and 2 and it was an excellent season they should be back with the number five class 
Ole Miss. Ole Miss won a national championship this season, and they signed the number six class. So Ole Miss should be in a pretty good spot overall to defend their crown this upcoming season. Ohio State. Ohio State comes in at number seven. They made it to the quarterfinals. They had a first round bye, but Navy did stun them. But Ohio State with that number seven class should be okay. But the first big surprise that we saw was Texas A&M. Texas A&M did finish below 500 yet again. It has turned low key into a poverty program, but they still sign top 10 classes. Seems like they just need the right coach. And once they have the right coach, Texas A&M is going to be a force to be reckoned with again. As for UCLA, these were your champions and your number three. They did not uh, defend their national championship. Didn't even remain ranked in the top 25. UCLA still had a decent season, and they have a great class to back it up. They finished with a number nine overall class. Up next at number 10 is Minnesota. The Golden Gophers were able to make it to the college football playoff at virtue of winning the American Conference. They should be right up there with the number 10 overall class. Nebraska is right behind them. This was a team that many felt was poised to make a deep run, and you know, a couple of upset losses kind of derailed that, but... A number 11 class, which means they're not going to rebuild. They should just be reloading, even with the amount of talent lost. Oregon. This was Remy Natalius' old team before he ended up taking a he the head coaching job um, outside of his conference. Uh, I believe he's over at Washington State now, if I remember correctly. But Remy Natalius helped sign the number 12 class at Oregon. Navy had that Lissendi run, and that helped out with recruiting tremendously. They end up signing the number 13 class. Army, on the other hand, they signed the 14 overall class, so Army and Navy should be competing close to the top of Conference USA for the foreseeable future. At number 15 is Utah. The Utes were able to sign the top 15 class in America. Utah did fade in the second half of the season, but Utah still had a very good season, and there should be poised to maybe take that next step, go for a 10-plus win season here going into year number five. At number 16 is Northern Illinois. Now, there was a little bit of a transition. Uh, Thomas Hammock Jr. did end up leaving to take the head coaching job at Ohio. Isaac Thompson will be taking his place as the offensive coordinator. So, Northern Illinois, they should be fine. There shouldn't be too, many, uh, too much transition, and they should still be competitive in the MAC going forward. Pittsburgh comes in at number 17 in the nation. The Pittsburgh Panthers uh, actually had an above average season themselves. A loss to Army did stop their chances from going to the Conference USA Championship game, but Pittsburgh should also be in that top tier and top echelon within the Conference USA. Tennessee, listen, Tennessee did struggle in year number four, outside of conference especially, but signed the number 18 class, I'm not worried about Tennessee moving forward. Just don't try not to have those uh, too many of those seasons in a row. However, this is another surprise here. The Nevada Wolfpack. Now, not going to lie. Nevada did suck this year. Nevada did finish number 19 overall. But the Wolfpack did end up signing the number 19 overall class uh, here in season number four. So, maybe this could be a class that could be utilized to... Maybe get Nevada Bull eligible moving forward. At number 20 is Virginia. The Cavaliers were able to sign a number 20 class in the nation. It's courtesy of signing 24 total players. Uh, the max is 25. Isaac Thompson has left to take the offensive coordinator job at Northern Illinois. So, interesting to see what Virginia does from here on out. Meanwhile, number 21 is the Stanford Cardinal, another Pac-12 team that did not go bowling. It just goes to show how much talent there is in the Pac-12 conference. Having a class like this, and you know, Stanford is kind of in the middle of the Pac-12 when it comes to recruiting prowess for the season. And then rounding out your group, you got LSU at 22, Baylor coming in at number 23, Penn State at number 24. They just sneak into the top 25 after beating LSU in their bowl game and rounding out your top 25 is the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Now with that said there were a couple of other recruiting classes that I wanted to take a moment to highlight that were not in this top 25 
Hawaii is in here at number 26. The Rainbow Warriors did make the college football playoff for the very first time, and the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors end up signing a number 26 class. So they almost got to the top 25, but you know, it all being close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and nuclear missiles. Still a pretty good class by Hawaii as it's a far cry from where they were back in season number one. However, one thing that I was disappointed about was how Miami recruited this particular cycle. They went all the way to the semifinal and they have a lot of talent on the roster now. The future looks questionable. They only signed five blue chip players and that's a big reason why they end up with the number 31 overall recruiting class uh, here in year number four. Could mean Miami is going in the wrong direction here. As for other notable things, Virginia Tech, who did win the ACC this year, ends up signing the number 43 overall class this year. Virginia Tech is more of a developmental program, so we'll see how Virginia Tech handles things in year number five. I would not be surprised if there's a little bit of a fall off going into year number five, though. However, the Cincinnati Bearcats do sign the number 46 overall class, so a nice job by Coach Dawkins, the recruiting coordinator at Cincinnati, to building a decent class. Maybe they can get closer to actually making a bowl game next year. Air Force, now led by head coach Jake Jacobs, was able to sign a decent class, even though this was a program that won one game and they are a military academy so it's hard to recruit at these uh military installations number 60 recruiting class which isn't terrible let's see if they can uh do a little bit better than two and ten try to build the damage that was done from the previous regime but the worst recruiting class among the teams that did make the college football playoff this year was the colorado buffaloes yes they finished in the top 25 but how long will that last though? Colorado finishes with a 64th overall class for a team that won 12 games this year and a bigger name program, you expect Colorado to recruit at a little bit higher of a level. Meanwhile, San Jose State, which is the new landing spot for Dion Kirby, who is going to be the offensive coordinator for Spartans, uh, does finish with a 67th ranked recruiting class. The first class that Remy Natalius brings in is going to be the 78th overall class, so a lot of work that needs to be done at Washington State if this Cougars team is going to be competitive in the Pac-12. The Duke Blue Devils with uh, Coach McNair has the 84th ranked recruiting class, so Duke may struggle to get into a bowl game there in year number five, but we'll see what happens. They did get to keep their head coach, which was a bonus because many people thought he was going to leave. That did not happen, thankfully. Ohio, with uh, Tommy Hammock Jr. now at the helm, brings in the number 93 class. So 10-3 to 3 is going to be tough to repeat in year number five, but Coach Hammock is up for the challenge. He built an NIU up from the ground. Old Dominion with its brand spanking new coach uh, with JD Weeks now over there. He comes from Troy. Old Dominion needs to get some more energy into the program. They finish 1-11 in and this 99th ranked recruiting class leaves a lot more to be desired. They at least recruited better than South Carolina though. Georgia State will also be looking for an infusion of energy as Georgia State brings in the 102nd ranked recruiting class. Uh, Joseph Fyker Krowski showing that maybe he's not as good of a coach as he was a college football player for those of you that follow that FCS series, of course. And then, of course, Justin Faith, uh, his first year at Texas State, nets a 112th ranked recruiting class. Um, so Texas State may struggle to get to a bowl game yet again in year number five. And then finally, you got Doug Rose, who used to play running back at Arkansas Pine Bluff. Well, he's here at Western Kentucky as the offensive coordinator. They only signed the 122nd ranked recruiting class, which is one of the worst in the NCSL. But the worst recruiting class in the country actually does belong to Eastern Carolina. Eastern Carolina actually had a long shot to go to the ACC championship. But it looks like Eastern Carolina is going to return back to the basement where they belong. So one last big change that is coming to the NCSL moving forward is that so for the uh, utility tool that's used uh, for uh, like NCAA revamped dynasties, they now include an option for a 14 team playoff 
And so I think we're going to do that here, boys. I think we're going to go ahead and do a 14 team playoff. And that will mean that there will be more opportunities for those that do not win a conference championship to still get into the college football playoffs. So there still will be automatic bids for every single conference. So all 10 conferences will have at least one team in its playoff. But instead of there being just two independent schools getting in, there will now be four independent schools coming in. So that will be the big one. And then also from here on out for these last few seasons, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one season per episode. We're about a few months away from EA College Football from dropping. So what I really want to go ahead and do here is I really just want to go ahead and I just want to focus in on the... Um, Yo, know, getting this series wrapped up so that when EA College Football comes around, we are going to go crazy on that particular game. And we're just a few months away from that. So next episode, you'll see the entirety of year number five. It's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a lot of action in these next few episodes. I hope you're, you know, excited for that. If you are, make sure you go ahead and smack that like button. Hit that subscribe button as well. If you do happen to be brand new to the channel, this is John J. Gaming on the mic signing off. But hoping you guys are all out there having a good one. Take care, everybody.